Okay, hello everyone to the Ecology Center seminar. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jonathan Hall, who is an ecologist, educator, writer, podcast producer, and wilderness enthusiast based in Warrington, West Virginia. He's currently the director of the Wilderness Geography Lab and assistant professor of geography at West Virginia University. And his research and teaching center is around critical wildlife geography and conservation, where he integrates the disciplines of black and indigenous geographies, ecology, political ecology, and conservation to solve environmental problems. Dr. Hall graduated from Morehouse College and with a BS in biology and focus on environmental studies and a PhD in ecology from the Ohio State University. Um, so welcome. Uh, Dr. Hall, and I'll let you uh, take it away. All right. Thank you, Dr. Beckman. I really appreciate it. And um, thank you to everyone. Uh, everyone can hear me. Yes. Good. Um, all right. Thanks. Um, uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for um, what's been a wonderful virtual visit thus far. Um, it's been really great to meet some of you. I'm looking forward to talking individually with many more of you. Uh, the, over the next uh, day. Um, and I, uh, among the many regrets of this global pandemic and the way that it's playing out here in the United States, I really regret the, uh, uh, the fact that I won't be able to, I'm not able to be there with you all in person. Um, I've never been to Utah. Uh, so I was really looking forward to, to seeing uh, the state and uh, to interacting with you all in person, but this is the, the next best thing. And then hopefully sometime in the near future, we'll be able to, to get together and meet, whether at a conference or at Utah State. Um, so this is the first of uh, two talks over the next couple of days. And um, what I'd like to do with this one, as I get my screen sharing together here, is to... Um, uh, talk a little bit about, um, talk more in broad strokes of what my work entails and to think about and uh, theorize with you all as I am doing um, what conservation geography in the Anthropocene looks like. All right, so for a, uh, a brief period, I'm going to start the presentation, share my screen, but then I have to unshare to load the computer sound because I'm going to play a video early on. Okay, so we'll be going in and out just for a, a quick second, but um, yeah, here we go. So the title of my talk, Conservation Geography in the Anthropocene. Um, and again, thank you all for this opportunity to share this work and talk about it. Before, um, before talking about um, the sort of the work in itself, I wanted to just give you a sense of like my own personal journey as a, um, a as, as somebody who was getting oriented to, to this field. And so my interest in the natural world began with watching nature on PBS with my family every Sunday night, really fond memories of that and being really intrigued by all the different organisms that were out there in the world and, and uh, wanting to learn more about them. I went to Morehouse College, which is a historically black college in Atlanta University. Um, and there did a undergraduate thesis on termite alarm behavior. Um, so I was really interested in social insects, uh, then went to the Ohio State University uh, and started working in an aquatic ecology lab. Um, but while I was in that lab, I realized that my interest was not so much the species in isolation, um, but it was the interaction between humans and um, fish species. Um, so I was sad to <laughs> live, uh, leave an opportunity to, to fish for delicious walleye, um, but I pivoted to a project um, in which ultimately became my dissertation work in Rajasthan, India, looking at the um, interaction between particular cultural groups within a rural landscape and the endangered um, and threatened species that um, they interacted with. Uh, so that became really kind of the foundations of thinking about conservation geography and this more integrated human uh, wildlife systems. Um, and then so uh, coming to West Virginia University as a postdoc and then um, uh, on the tenure track, uh, I got interested in working with California condors. And again, the interface between what human beings are doing on the landscape um, 
and how they are impacting a critically endangered species. And the transition or the, the connection between Rajasthan and um, uh, California condors were the vulture species in Rajasthan that were being impacted by human practices. And then being able to work with somebody at, at uh, West Virginia who was looking at similar issues um, with uh, California condors. Todd Katzmer, some of you all might know who that is. Uh, he works for USGS and he's a, a raptor biologist. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll end the talk talking about the ways in which this work is personal. Um, and so when I moved to West Virginia, having not lived in, in um, this area, I was curious about what it meant to be a West Virginian and to, to embrace that mountaineer spirit uh, to a degree. Um, and I grew up fishing, um, but I thought, oh, I'll take up hunting. And that, that sounds interesting. Um, so here's a picture of me um, on a hunt with a, with a deer. But I began to, to wonder about, um, and in conversations with colleagues, what wild food meant for food systems. And in West Virginia, you know, the, the um, food insecurity is particularly acute. Uh, poverty levels are particularly high uh, across the state. And so what would it mean, what does it mean for people to be provisioning from the landscape, um, which is something that people did, but how is that being accounted for in the food system? So that's kind of a broad stroke of like my own personal journey um, into this field and some of the things that, I'm, that I uh, am studying. So, I need to stop sharing my screen for just a second um, and I'm going to go back and play a video. So you're not going to be able to hear my voice because um, I haven't figured out how to hear for you all to hear my voice and to play from the audio so that you all can hear it. So I'm going to play a video which gives kind of an overview of the condor research that we're doing in the lab. Um, in the wilderness geography lab and then I'll talk about I'll come back and talk about um, uh, the work and some of the findings that we have um, from from that research. Okay, so now I'm going to share screen and share my video. Okay, so here we go. It's intimidating flying into LAX and looking at the scale of humanity uh, in LA is just it's mind-boggling. Oftentimes, I find it difficult to wrap my mind around the amount of resources it takes to keep dozens of millions of people going. Human beings practicing modern civilization have such an impact. I teach natural resources and biogeography. I'm trying to get students to question the premise of like modernity and modern civilization. I think they need something a little bit more explicit as to how they're going to contribute to the problems that they're very aware of. Certain human beings aren't uh, doing all that they can to kind of hold back the negative impacts of modern civilization, then those birds are going extinct. They're deeply tied to what human beings in modern civilization are doing. The goal of, of my lab is to better understand the relationship between humans practicing modern civilization and wilderness. It's not so much to understand the animals or the wildlife. It's not so much to understand the people, the modern civilized people, but it's to understand that reality. Did you find that here? No, yeah. up there. Okay. Maybe a blank. Yeah. I think one of the most valuable things is that you, you gain a visceral understanding of what these problems look like. You know, I think when, you, when you're able to see it, there's one thing to be able to see it on YouTube or in a textbook or something like that. But when you're driving through these areas and you're like, that's what's happening, I think you gain that, that visceral experience. I think 
having first-hand knowledge of what it takes both to kind of keep our civilization going and what it takes to keep conservation and the species alive, I think is really important for them to kind of think about. towards the condor is just the, the amount of work that it takes to monitor these birds, make sure they're doing okay, um, and all the things that we have to check on individual birds. Okay for now. Okay. We have to take a blood sample, we have to check to see their body condition by feeling the keel and whether or not the breasts of the bird are kind of full or if they're not doing so well, then they feel kind of thin around the, the keel. Um, you know, whether or not they have parasites. Uh, checking the tail feathers individually to see like, oh, these feathers are growing, these aren't. So Linda's got You know, all these sorts of things. And, you know, we spend anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes per bird during this workup. Um, and so that takes a long time. I was terrified of them, uh, seeing them being handled by other people and like how much focus and like, I guess technique you needed to have to hold and handle them. You're, centimeters away from this mouth that could bite off a finger and you're just like muzzling it with your own hand. Perfect. Their presence, at least to me, means like that we're crying out for a cure. The thing that, that really excites me about the work that we're doing is that that brings to the forefront the question of how do we reconcile the way in which we live and the desire to keep these animals around. I think a lot of folks in the conservation field are trying to hold back the floodgates. Okay, can you all hear me now? Okay, good, all right. So now I'm gonna share my screen again um, so that you all can, uh, so we can continue our conversation. Um, so I'm not gonna share computer audio, good and good. All right, um, so a quick funny story about that video, Lindsay Blackburn, who's an undergraduate student in, in uh, my lab, um, the bird that she was holding actually peed on her the entire time she was um, holding it. And that's something that, that's never happened. Um, so we, we always like to tease Lindsay uh, about that. So I love that this is being recorded so I can show, I can tell her about that. Um, so to, just to give some broad strokes on um, the work that we've been doing with Condor since about 2014. Um, and again, I'll talk more in detail about this specific work, but I wanted to, just in case people aren't able to make it tomorrow, just sort of show you what we've been uh, we've been looking at. And so, looking at this telemetry data, which is really powerful, we're able to get a very high spatial and temporal resolution on where these birds are traveling and how they're moving across the landscape. Um, so we're looking at optimal uh, ground foraging conditions, right? So these birds are encountering things like lead and micro trash while they're foraging on the ground. And so understanding where they're moving and how they're using the landscape in terms of ground foraging habitat is really important. Um, so one of the things that we found is that foraging for these birds with the time that they're spending on the ground happens within about a three hour window during the day. And that makes sense because during that middle part of the day, the uh, atmospheric conditions are optimal for um, uh, thermal lift and these birds that don't do use a lot of flapping flight can get off the ground, right? Uh, but that's also very important because we can be a little bit more targeted with our management. Um, as one might expect, uh, their foraging activity increases during the, the late summer and early fall. Again, that has to do uh, with optimal um, uh, thermal conditions, and so they're less active during the winter months. And this is in California, I should say, 
and uh, not with the population that's in um, Utah. I haven't, I haven't studied the, the population in Utah in the Grand Canyon region. And so looking at this Southern California population, we've also been able to determine that there are specific land cover types that they frequent more than others. Um, and that's really important because it feeds into this idea of, of building these targeted species and landscape management practices. So, you know, looking at this high resolution location and movement data, we're able to come up with more high resolution um, management practices. Some really important stuff that's exciting with the technology with um, uh, telemetry, as, as I'm sure many of you, you know. Um, and then so looking at condors and lead exposure, right? So one of the biggest um, uh, killers of condors uh, is lead poisoning, is consumption of lead from spent ammunition. Um, and so again, looking at the populations in California, where are they exposed to lead and looking at their blood lead concentration. Um, and again, tomorrow we can talk about like the, the pros and cons of looking at blood lead concentration for determining lead exposure. Um, but also looking at land cover type and particularly land management type. And so in Southern California before um, last year, there were areas where you could use lead ammunition for hunting. Um, and of course now California has instituted a statewide ban on lead. Um, but looking at the telemetry data, which uh, began to be collected in 2013, we can see whether or not condors and how condors are moving across these different land management regi regimes and foraging, whether or not condors that spend more time foraging on in areas that don't have lead policy or don't have lead ammunition bans, whether or not they have lower uh, blood lead concentrations. And in fact, that's actually what we found that the birds in Southern California flock um, who have higher blood lead concentrations are spending significantly more time in areas where um, the either state or private organization or um, federal land um, doesn't have jurisdiction and people presumably are using lead. So really important findings. And the, you know, the other aspect of the, the work is looking at condors and fire. And in keeping with the tra tradition of giving students in my lab a hard time, um, this is a picture of Darren Gross, who is um, one of the biggest bird nerds you will ever meet. Uh, has a lot of experience handling uh, different birds and different raptors. And I'm so happy I captured this photo because as you can see, this is a condor escaping the net and not only a condor, but a juvenile condor. Um, so, uh, you know, I just like to, to give my students a good nature hard time, but Darren has been doing work on um, condors and wildfires. Um, and so how do these birds respond to the fires that are on the landscape and particularly these, these huge conflagrations, which California is in the midst of, again, this fire season. Um, and so we, we got a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Service to look at, um, again, this telemetry data um, as it relates to uh, condor uh, roosting habitat and whether or not condors are responding to fire on the landscape in Los Padres National Forest. And so that work is in, still in its preliminary stages, but it, it, it looks like of the roosting habitat um, and uh, foraging habitat that condors are occupying in Los Padres, the overwhelming majority of that is happening in areas that have experienced fire in the last decade. Um, and so that suggests that fire is a necessary element of condor movement ecology and foraging ecology. And that makes sense. You know, these birds that are, that are living in this landscape, um, uh, needing this, the space and underbrush cleared so that they can access food is really important. But then we can begin to think about what that means in this new fire regime um, and how these birds that have been extirpated from the landscape are being reintroduced and how they're responding to fires. Uh, unfortunately, this year is shaping up in California, at least to be the deadliest year for condors and fire. Um, uh, last I, I count, I think the number was um, 10 presumed dead from fire specifically. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a tough uh, uh, space for, for condors to be existing in. And we can talk about, and we will in this talk, um, sort of like how, how that fire regime comes into play and how do we as practitioners and researchers grapple with the, the story of the land. Um, and so another aspect of the, of, of the work in the lab is, is looking at wild food. I was really encouraged to talk to some, some folks today about their own personal interaction with wild food and hunting. 
uh, and what it meant to them. And so we begin to ask this question more broadly about what, what is the extent of wild food provisioning in the 21st century and particularly in the global north um, because you know wild food research, hunting research is much better researched and understood in the global south in so-called developing areas where people are um, using subsistence hunting as a means for, of food security. But you know, we, we understand that is the case, and, and some of you have had this experience growing up, that food provisioning is part of your own subsistence at home, right? It's important for you all uh, here. And so what is the relationship between wild food provisioning and food security? Um, and how important is it for people living in the global north? And that's what we were doing, uh, looking at wild food and hunting in West Virginia. Uh, so, so a brief overview of those findings. Um, and a picture of some homemade deer sausage, of course. Um, so what we found in West Virginia that there were um, over 10 million pounds of uh, wild game, uh, wild big game coming off the landscape uh, every year. And so that's mostly white-tailed deer, but it also includes um, black bear and um, a couple dozen uh, feral pigs uh, being harvested. But that's mostly white-tailed deer. So that's a tremendous amount of of, of meat, of, of food that's coming off the landscape. Um, but it can also be a little bit difficult to understand like what does 10 million pounds of, of red meat like mean? Um, and so part of the challenge in this work was trying to, to make that, that amount accessible and understandable. And so if we look at the, um, the, the average American's consumption of red meat uh, per year, which is about 100 pounds of red meat per year per American, um, the amount that's coming off the landscape uh, in West Virginia is enough to feed 100,000 people, right? And so that's, that's a significant, uh, that's a significant um, amount of food that's coming from the landscape. And when we compare the wild food, the wild red meat that's taken off the landscape versus what's grown and produced and available locally in West Virginia, so we're talking about the red meat, that domesticated red meat that's raised and processed within the state, um, the, the wild food exceeds that by about 25%. And I should say that most of the domesticated meat that's raised in West Virginia is shipped out of state. And it's actually shipped out of state alive um, and processed in other facilities outside of West Virginia. And so we, we can then begin to think about like, how does, how does this process of domesticated meat production um, and this resource resemble the extractive resources of Appalachia, right? The coal industry, the fracking industry, having outside of the state interests coming in, using resources, affecting the environment, and then taking those resources away. And then very likely in the case of, of domesticated meat, selling it back to uh, members of the community from which it came, which is a, a common practice that we see um, uh, across the world. Um, and then also comparing, you know, the wild food uh, meat that's available for consumption to neighboring states, we see that West Virginia has a much higher per capita rate of um, uh, wild meat consumption. Now, I should say that we don't actually know uh, what, what amount of meat is consumed by West Virginians, uh, as opposed to people who come out of state and hunt in West Virginia and then take that meat out of state. So we're still sort of um, uh, pinning, pinning that down. But what's available for consumption within the state uh, is the comparison here. And then in looking at the per, kilom per square kilometer uh, production in terms of what red meat's available domestically uh, from West Virginia versus the wild game, we can see that 50 more pounds of wild game come off the landscape than domesticated meat, right? And so that begins to, we begin to be able to answer questions of, um, or begin to ask questions of, you know, what 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 is the most efficient way of producing the red meat that people consume, right? What are the energy inputs? You know, certainly there's a, a lot more that goes into producing uh, a million pounds of deer meat than a million pounds of cattle in terms of uh, feed, in terms of water, in terms of uh, land management, all of those things. Um, and so this is where that work is going. We're beginning to to ask these more qualitative questions to, to, to um, tease out these relationships. Um, and so that, that work was recently published in, a, in Applied Geography um, uh, earlier this year. Okay, so 
that's that's kind of like the the what what I think many people are are uh, used to when we talk about ecology, we talk about conservation, and this work. But we need to talk about, and this is what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about: the elephant in the room. Um, and I love this drawing um, of the elephant in the room, and you know the people that are there, kind of like ignoring it and not paying attention to it, because of course that's that's what's meant by it. And so the elephant in the room, when we're talking about landscapes, when we're talking about species, when we're talking about management, when we're talking about um, who is on the landscape and how it's being used, are these socio these these social structures that have shaped our environment that have shaped the way that we understand the history of these lands and the history of the people that are here. Um, and so I want to go over some things that are not said and also not really well understood, but are important and shape our understanding or shape the way that we interact with these different issues, whether or we're conscious of it or not, or whether or not we admit it or not. And so the first thing that um, is not said, and in many cases not well understood, um, is that all these lands were stolen. Um, and this is a picture from the amazing project, journalistic project from High Country News, um, the issue Land Grab Universities. Um, and this idea um, that is, you know, present in history and, and uh, but not well talked about is where did all of the land come from for these land grant institutions. And what does it mean to be a land grant institution, right? And we say that being a land grant institution is, you know, we, we have a responsibility to the people of, of these lands. We have a responsibility to the people that are served by this institution. Um, but the, the resources to fund those um, institutions came from um, the Morrill Act, um, and the Morrill Act was made possible by the appropriation of indigenous lands. And so institutions, not just Utah State, but I just have Utah State on here because it's a land grant institution and we're, we're talking about where we're here at Utah State. Um, you can go onto this website and see where the land that Utah State University used to uh, fund the, uh, the opening and the early stages of the university came from. And we can see that it comes from a bunch of different lands that were gained by the US government in the wake of the Civil War, in the wake of um, the, the, the different conflicts that were occurring with indigenous people in, in what's now considered the American West. Um, those lands were stolen or uh, uh, coerced into being given up, right? And so that's an important aspect that we don't often talk about and that we really don't understand, I think, at least in my experience. And so whose lands do we occupy? Who, whose lands are we sitting on? And there's a, a wonderful website called nativeland.ca uh, where you can go and look at, type in a, a location, Logan, Utah, Morgantown, West Virginia, and see who were the first people of these lands and, and, and who did they occupy? So. Logan, uh, Utah sits on the historic lands of the Shoshone Bannock and the Eastern Shoshone people. Um, uh, and many of these people are still, still here, not in the same way that they, they have been in the past. And to not only pick on Utah State, right? Because I also uh, am employed and live in an area that of a land grant institution. And so those lands uh, uh, sit on the, the Shawnee and Musawomek people's historic territories. And so this is something that we need to um, integrate into our understanding of conservation. We need to integrate into our understanding of our practice as uh, people who are working in, in, in this field. Another thing that's not understood uh, or not said and, and not well understood is that structural racism is one of, if not the most guiding principle of American society. Um, here is a, a book by um, a uh, fantastic uh, uh, geographer by the name of Ruth Wilson Gilmore. It's called Golden Gulag. It's Prisons, Surplus, Crisis, and Opposition in Globalizing California. All right. And it's looking at the prison industrial complex as an offshoot of the institution of slavery um, and how the policies that were put in, into place post-emancipation have shaped the ways in which um, opportunities have been made available to newly emancipated Black people and their descendants, right? And we're going to talk about some of the trends that we see within our within the field of ecology and conservation. 
Um, and to, again, bring this home, right? Because oftentimes we talk about, you know, the, the issue of racism and structural racism as being something in the past, right? It's something that happened way back then and like, you know, Lincoln freed the slaves and Martin Luther King marched and like, we're all good now. Like, we don't have to worry about it. Um, everybody has equal opportunity. Um, but to, 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 to disrupt that narrative that I think we're socialized to take up, no matter who we are, we're socialized to take that narrative up. You know, I have a question about, you know, anti-miscegenation laws in Utah. And these were a, a set of laws that existed across the United States um, that prevented the, the marriage of uh, white people to, to non-white people, right? It was illegal for you to get married as a white person to a uh, black person or indigenous person or an Asian person. Um, does anybody know when the anti-miscegenation law was repealed in Utah? I guess not. 1963. Okay, so when we talk about this history being something of the past, I mean, it is in the past, right? But to put that into context, in 1963, my father was 21 years old, okay? And, you know, in talking with him about his experiences gaining an education and living in America, um, you know, he still remembers a friend of his, um, my, my parents went to school in, at a historically black college in Alabama. He still remembers uh, one of his classmates who had the misfortune of falling asleep at a bus station uh, in the whites only section and was almost beaten to death and missed an entire year of school because of those injuries, right? And so this history about how, um, how race and racism has structured our society is very distant and still very apparent. Um, so, when we talk about the, the Anthropocene, right, when we talk about this new geological epoch in which human beings are impacting the environment, oftentimes it's said, you know, we talk about humans as we humans, like all humans are doing these things. Um, we're all having this impact. Um, and I, I have come to this idea that we need to disrupt that, right, because we who? Because the individuals and the, the, the people who have been in charge of making the decisions that have led us to this point of environmental crisis have been very specific. And particularly those who, and the, particularly there have been people who have been structurally disempowered from that. So we think about white supremacy as the, the sort of guiding structure of America and its founding, right? And that's not really a controversial thing to say that white supremacy is the guiding structure of America. All you have to do is look at the laws of this country, who was considered um, uh, to be able to be in power and those sorts of things and how recent it has been since that structure has been disrupted. So white supremacy, but also patriarchy. Uh, we can't forget patriarchy has been really important for structuring power. Um, and power has, and who has had power and the decisions that, have, that they have made over the course of, of history, at least in these areas for the last several centuries, uh, we see the direct result of disenfranchisement um, in the exclusion of certain people and their practices and their ways of understanding having consequences in the same way that uh, any environment that becomes less diverse in species becomes more vulnerable to disturbance, right? We understand that as an ecological principle, but it's also a sociological principle. So white supremacy is a global ecological phenomenon. And when I say white supremacy, I'm not necessarily talking about like the Ku Klux Klan and people who are openly, violently um, hateful and racist to certain people, but I'm talking about a structure in which white people, people who are described as white or identified as white have more power than people who are not identified in that particular way, right? White supremacy is a global ecological phenomenon. We can look at the, uh, the history of people who have called themselves white and interactions with different cultures and the things that happen to those people in those areas. Um, we can look at the history of colonization. We can look at the history of settler colonialism in these areas. And, you know, we understand that certain people were, certain human beings were affected negatively by this, but there are also things that happen to the environment and non-human species that are very different from how those environments evolved in the communities that were there. Uh, Davis and Todd um, had a paper in 2017, which locates, they make the argument to locate the start of the Anthropocene to settler colonialism in North America. So we're talking Christopher Columbus, 
1492 and then European colonization as the start of the Anthropocene, the start of these large scale geological changes that happen in our environment. It's, in, it's an interesting article that I suggest um, you know, reading. And so white supremacy changes landscapes um, in, in very common ways and very, in very specific ways. And I think that that's part of the elephant in the room. Um, like who specifically is in power and who has been making these changes and making these decisions. And to, so, to show some examples of this, here's a picture of a logging operation in, in, in uh, West Virginia. Um, and this is a very different ecological regime that had existed in these lands for millennia prior to it. And it's directly related to the settler colonial state, the, the establishment of a white republic, um, and the, uh, the extirpation of indigenous people from those lands. You know, we can look at Buffalo and certainly the macrofauna in this part of the world were, was on the decline and was negatively impacted by uh, human beings on, on being in these lands. But we see a sharp escalation in the extinction of Buffalo and other species at the onset of European colonization. And in fact, when we look at buffalo specifically, you know, buffalo were hunted to near extinction um, because of the uh, the economic market that was available um, in their hides, um, but also specifically to disempower um, Dakota, Lakota, and other indigenous groups so that they didn't have a food base, so that they could uh, be uh, less likely to and uh, less able to resist um, uh, the the US government in wanting to appropriate their lands. I mean, this is a, a strategy to disempower indigenous people for the specific purpose of taking their lands. And so the disappearance of Buffalo <laughs> from these landscapes uh, is directly related to land grant institutions, right? If the Buffalo are, and, and the people who are um, dependent upon these Buffalo still have that food source, they're still able to resist the, the US government's taking of their lands without the Buffalo they're, they're less likely to resist. Um, so again, you know, these things. Here's another example. Um, and this is a really stark example. Uh, Mount Rushmore, you know, a monument to the United States of America. But we have to look at who's on this monument. We have um, two people who were some of the largest enslavers in the uh, United States history, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Um, uh, George Washington built his military reputation on killing Native American people or indigenous people. Um, Thomas Jefferson um, uh, was uh, another person who instantiated this policy and enslaved African peoples. Um, Abraham Lincoln certainly credited with um, the Emancipation Proclamation, although uh, I don't know if I didn't I didn't know this until recently that the Emancipation Proclamation did not outlaw um, slavery in all places, that states that had um, been part of the Union were, were exempt from the abolition of slavery. So states like Delaware and I think Missouri were exempt because they had joined the Union. So the Emancipation Proclamation was more about taking away a resource from Southern states who were wanting to secede than actually the principle of people shouldn't be enslaved. Um, and then we have Teddy Roosevelt, who is responsible for, largely responsible for the, the public lands landscape that we understand in this country. But certainly, um, you know, there was conflict between the remaining resisting indigenous people um, of these lands. And Teddy had some really problematic views on black people and indigenous people, right? And so these individuals are complex people um, in and of themselves, but the fact that this monument exists on unceded land of the Lakota people um, in violation of the treaty that they signed, that the United States signed with this, this tribe on sacred land in the Black Hills is insult to injury, right? And so, you know, this is this monument, but it is a monument to white supremacy. It's a monument to the subjugation of uh, indigenous people and, and uh, uh, of black people in this country, right? And this is, part of this story. This is part of, of what we need to be dealing with um, and, and thinking about in our, in our practice. Um, and then we can look at, um, you know, the results of land management in aquatic environments. Um, and the fact that, you know, that in many places in the Gulf of Mexico and the Great Lakes, we're dealing with 
um, eutrophic zones and um, anoxic zones and nutrient inputs that are causing this cascade effects to aquatic environments. Um, and that's a direct result of the land management practices uh, of the last 500 years, right? We didn't have these sorts of issues, these broad scale issues that threatened to collapse these environments. Um, when the, uh, the people who were managing these lands were empowered, when the people were, um, uh, had their, their rights to self-determination um, and were in conversation with the landscape in a way that um, it supported sustainability. Right? We're dealing with this because of the ways in which these uh, ecological practices and land management practices have existed um, in, in the recent history. So we can take a look at like all of this, you know, really heavy stuff um, and this history and how it plays out within condor research. Um, and so looking at non-lead ammunition outreach, which is um, an important part of condor conservation, um, talking with individuals in spaces about how they're using um, their firearms and you know what ways that they could they might be able to change in order to better support other members of the ecological community, um, but going out to rural areas in America and talking with landowners in America, we're talking about a physical and socio political white supremacist landscape. The overwhelming majority of rural land in America are owned by white people, and that's not by accident. That's not because you know once black people were freed from uh, from slavery, they were like we're done we're done farming. We don't want to do that anymore. Um, many many uh, black people in in um, post and post emancipation United States wanted to do farming. They wanted to have that land base. They wanted to be self sufficient. But you know the reason why they weren't allowed to keep that land and why there was more land owned by black people. Um, in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War than today is because of white supremacist violence. And the explicit understanding that if people had a land base, they had power, right? They had the ability to, to uh, subsist on the landscape. They had voting power, they had an interest. And so if you disenfranchise those people, then they become uh, less able to participate in the political process. Um, and so, we're living in a landscape today where the rural areas, the rural spaces in, in North America are overwhelmingly white, not by accident, but by design. Um, and so what does it mean to go into those spaces as a researcher? The, the primary lead outreach coordinator is a self-described redneck. Um, and I don't have an issue with that term or, or, or with rednecks. I know people who call themselves rednecks and like good, good fun, but that is a very sort of, um, as somebody thinking about, as, as a non-white person going into these spaces or thinking about going into these spaces, that, that your ears perk up. Like, okay, well, wh what environment am I going into? And to, to, to be a redneck as at, in a non-pejorative sense, right? Because it, it can be a pejorative sense, but it's also something that's claimed by people. Like there's a certain cultural understanding of, of what that means. And um, being in those spaces and, and working in those spaces um, as a person who does not, who is not able to take up that identity, right? I would, I would never be able to describe myself as such um, because it doesn't, that, that the cultural understanding of what that means doesn't, doesn't fit for me. So, but you know, that, that is something that we have to think about and we have to grapple with uh, when we're doing field research, right? Um, do, do people feel safe um, and welcomed and, and understood in those spaces? Are they expected in those spaces? Um, and so we can look about research practitioners and I'm just thinking of one particular person, you know, just randomly selected them and looking at the trends that we see within our field, right? So in 2011, when I earned my PhD in ecology, there were only three other African-American individuals out of 330 US citizens who earned a PhD, All right? And that's not by accident. And it's not because black people don't like, like ecology. We love ecology. Um, you know, uh, looking at my college, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences at WVU, which has 290 faculty, I'm one of four tenured or tenure track African American faculty in in the uh, in the college, and the first African American faculty in the history of geography at WVU. Okay, and that's not by accident. Um, 
Uh, and as far as I know, there's only one black person with a PhD uh, working on condors. And believe me, every single meeting I go to, I'm looking for other people who look like me and trying to recruit other people who look like me in this space. Um, because it's it's nice to, to, to have people who have a shared experience without explanation in those spaces. And I should say that these patterns, particularly in the modern context within the last 50 years or so, is not because there are people who are actively opposing the inclusion, the greater inclusion of people in these spaces or there are people who are, who are gatekeepers and like no black people, no indigenous people, but it's because of the structures that have been built and the ways that they have been con constructed and the rewards that people have had and the access that people, uh, people have had to resources um, that has set up this momentum that if we don't actively oppose these structures and change them and are critical about them, we're going to continue, continue to see these patterns. And it has nothing to do with any individual's personal feeling about, um, you know, race or, or whatever. It has to do with the structures that need to be disrupted. Um, and so in thinking about indigenous communities and the conversations between indigenous communities and uh, conservation, condor conservation are, are picking up. But as it stands right now, the indigenous people who come to those meetings don't speak. It's the, the white liaisons and non-indigenous liaisons who are having presentations and those sorts of things. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but eventually we wanna be moving to a place where indigenous people are able to speak for their own interests and don't have intermediaries to do so. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting dynamic. Um, and so, Given this history, given these patterns, and given this, this, this challenge that I'm offering of us confronting conservation in this field, like how does that happen? What do we do, right? Um, and so we have to recognize that conservation is part of the settler colonial project. Like we, we, are all, we all exist in a system that was built by people who stole land and disenfranchised people um, and have increasingly done so to a lesser degree over history very slowly, um, but we're coming out of that system, right? And so we have to be critical about the ways in which that system has influenced how we practice this field of conservation, how we understand um, our way forward, right? So again, all these lands were stolen. So I'm going to make some recommendations uh, of, of things to, 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 to read and to interact with. And so this book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne dunbar Ortiz, is a fantastic book. Um, and uh, something that I think should be essential reading for anybody who's getting an education in the United States. I mentioned uh, Teddy Roosevelt and um, John Muir, right, who are responsible for the national park system, but we need to be critical about who they were, right? And the Sierra Club recently um, uh, came publicly came to terms with the fact that John Muir was racist. He had very racist ideas about indigenous people and black people, right? And so what does that mean when we're talking about public land and who owns the land and who's allowed to be in those spaces? Um, it's also interesting to think about the, the fact that around the same time that anti-miscegenation laws were being, were being repealed in the United States, around the same time where um, uh, higher education was being broadened so that it included uh, women and non-white people. Um, uh, we we had the um, we we had a desegregation of our national park spaces, right? And so, you know, my father growing up could not go to um, the state parks and the and the national parks. Um, um, and so he didn't grow up with that appreciation for the, 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 public, the public outdoor space, these big spaces, right? So we have to, to uh, confront that. And also the fact that they were two moral acts. They were two land grant acts. I don't know if you all knew that. There was one for white institutions and the second moral act, which actually um, allowed for my institution to be founded, Morehouse College, was for Negro institutions, right? And so that history is still alive today. Um, and so we have to understand that species loss and ecological destabilization is directly related to white supremacy. It's directly related to the ways in which um, co uh, colonizers and settler colonialists decided that they were going to use the land, which was very different from the ways in which the indigenous communities were, were using the land and had been using the land. And the species that evolved in those spaces had been understanding the land. So this concept of invasive ecologies is something that I'm kind of like working with and thinking through. So 
I, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about it here and, and hopefully we can continue the conversation. Okay, so now I wanna pivot and, and to end with um, thinking about um, you know, how this work is personal um, which is something that I've taken from um, other uh, black scholars in the field of conservation in the outdoors. And so I, I just have to share this because this is just like one of the coolest moments of my life on Parts Unknown. That is me sitting next to the late Anthony Bourdain for the West Virginia Parts Unknown episode. Um, and I am I'm staying very close to that hard cider because I was so nervous. I didn't know that I was actually going to be at the hero table, what they called it, um, and sitting next to Bourdain until about 10 minutes before they started filming. Um, so I was, I was uh, sipping on the liquid courage to like calm my nerves. Um, but one of the reasons why I felt nervous was because I'm, I'm not from West Virginia um, and I was just beginning and I'm still beginning to understand my relationship with place, with the geography here, what it means to be a West Virginian, what it means to be a black West Virginian. Um, and so, but I really am thankful for the opportunity because it, it to, to interact in this way, because it, it allowed me to think about these things and, and bring kind of the personal into the work, right? And so two um, uh, scholars and mentors of mine who I really look up to, uh, one from afar and one who, whom I know um, personally are uh, Drew Lanham and uh, Carolyn Finney. Um, some of you all might know either of these, these people. Drew Lanham is a, an ornithologist, uh, I think he's a professor emeritus at Clemson University. And uh, he wrote an amazing memoir, uh, The Home Place, but also has a video online called Birding While Black, right? And this idea of bringing the personal into his work and what it means to be uh, a black person, a black man, um, doing this work in the field, right? And, and the fact that there are a whole set of, of considerations that he has to have and he has had through his career because of who he is, of the skin that he lived, the body that he lives in, um, and the ways in which that body is understood in the broader society. Um, Carolyn Finney is um, an amazing um, scholar uh, who has written about, you know, the structural, uh, the, the issues of structural racism and discrimination within outdoor spaces. Um, she's been a member of the Board of National Parks. She's an incredibly active uh, scholar and activist um, and wrote an important book, Black Faces, White Spaces, Reimagining the, the Great Outdoors from the Perspective of African-Americans. So two readings, but particularly Finney's book, I think it should be standard reading for everyone who's working in this field because you begin to understand how structural racism and oppression and race figures into this field where we often don't have to think about it, um, particularly if we are, um, living in a, in a body that's understood to be, to have access to these, to these spaces. Um, and so I channeled this, this kind of mentorship from these two scholars into thinking about my own journey as a hunter. And so borrowing from Drew, uh, Dr. Lanham's Burning Wild Black, I wrote this article, Hunting Wild Black, and then a companion article, which looks at the ways in which this history, which I've talked about, plays into uh, my own journey as somebody who didn't grow up hunting, didn't grow up having firearms in the house, learning to do that and what that means and the conversation between structural um, uh, racism and, um, and the outdoors. So trying to carry the torch for, for, for these people. Um, and so the responses to those, to those articles are really interesting. I'm just gonna put them up here so you all can read. Um, you know, you, you never read the comments on social media, but I read the comments on social media because I was just curious to see how people were responding. And I think it's illustrative of the ways in which these conversations get derailed because of how we're entering into them and how we are understanding our own identities as it relates to this broader story that we all share. And so what these responses uh, indicate to me is that there is a fundamental lack of understanding and I think an unwillingness to understand the role of this history, uh, the history of white supremacy, the history of oppression of certain people into our everyday lives. We don't like to think about it. And that's a, there's a reason why many of us are not educated on these unpleasant histories is because they're unpleasant. But I think as people who work in this field, we have to, we have to build up the resistance to, or we have to build up um, 
the ability to withstand these conversations to think about and talk about our work because it, it, it makes sense to, to think about these things, okay? And so in conservation geography, this is what I'm sort of like posing and theorizing. And I'll end with this, um, these, these next couple of slides. You know, I always love this quote of, you know, nothing in biology makes sense um, except in the light of evolution. Um, and that's, you know, such a powerful quote, right? I mean, how do you understand biology? How do you understand life? without the theory of evolution by natural selection, right? And how do you understand it without these principles? But I think similarly, conservation doesn't make sense, right? When we're talking about land, when we're talking about species conservation, we're talking about the ways in which human beings interact with these landscapes. Nothing makes sense outside of the light of black and indigenous geographies. We have to understand this history explicitly and from the perspective of people who have been marginalized uh, because they had been disenfranchised from decision making, from narrative building, from understanding or from contributing their ideas to this to this landscape um, and to this field. And so here are a bunch of recommendations on the screen. All of them are amazing. Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, is one of the most beautifully written um, books that I've ever read in my entire life. Uh, she's an indigenous woman who's also a, a plant physi or a plant biologist. And she is doing the work of, of braiding, essentially, indigenous ways of knowing and um, settler colonial science ways of knowing, right? In a, in a really amazing way that I think makes space for both um, and, and understanding that. I mentioned land grab universities, um, a really important um, uh, piece by High Country News that I encourage everyone to interact with. Um, on the two outside bottom, um, uh, columns here. We have a book by uh, geographer Clyde Woods and looking at um, development in the Mississippi Delta region, which is central to understanding the United States of America, the cotton uh, plantation and the cotton regime that essentially built the wealth of this country and the ways in which indigenous people were, were removed from the landscape and the way that enslaved Africans were, were used to work the landscape and in the aftermath of that. A collection of pieces in, in racial ecologies um, which is also really important, some little vignettes of understanding, you know, what I'm talking about with race and uh, indigeneity within the field of conservation. I've listed in the middle two um, science fiction fantasy works because I think that, um, you know, having an intellectual understanding of these issues is important, but it's not the whole story. And I think a lot of people, um, human beings, uh, as I as I understand, we're, we're a storytelling uh, animal, like we, we thrive on stories. If we don't have a narrative that we can accept about anything, um, then it's hard for us to, to inculcate it and to, to take it up. And so I really found that talking about these issues in, so, in a somewhat indirect way through speculative fiction is both really enjoyable because I love science fiction and, and fantasy, but these authors are, are really talking about issues of race, issues of ecology, issues of geography, issues of geology in their work. Um, and so it's just another way to interface with these with these uh, ideas and with these perspectives that you know you you may not all, um, otherwise have come across. Okay, so um, you know, and moving forward, I think it's important for us to, and if if we are going to sort of confront this issue of bringing these topics more into the forefront, um, uh, we have to be honest about what we actually want, right? So having an anti-racist society means we need to be different people. It doesn't mean that we can just sort of like sprinkle some diversity onto something and then add brown people and then like we're good. We actually have to be fundamentally different people. Um, and most people don't wanna do the work. Um, and so we have to be honest about that. And if you don't wanna do the work, that's fine. Um, I mean, that's not really fine from my personal perspective, but you know, I think we need to be honest about that. A lot of people want to claim allyship and accompliceship without actually recognizing that we have to be different people and not just the people who have benefited, but also the people who have been, have been marginalized. And we have to be honest about who we've been without diversity. Um, and so are we willing to audit our practice? Are we willing to look at who we've been without having these things in the forefront, right? So are we willing to audit our colloquium invitees? And I really take my hat off to you all at Utah State um, and the, you know, the ecological um, Research Center, because you all are being very intentional about who you're inviting to these spaces. 
And looking at the list of speakers, you know, past and, and present, I can see that there is this intention to broaden the conversation. And I really, really do appreciate that. Um, you know, looking at student demographics, recruitment and retention. Are we looking at these things? Who is coming through and being educated in our departments? Um, and who is being left out? Faculty demographics and hiring, you know, um, not so much in this landscape, this uh, economic landscape, but, you know, moving forward, um, who, are, who, who are the people who are doing the educating and doing the researching? Are we willing to audit our hiring process and be critical about that? Um, to, to actively disrupt our, um, uh, our, our practice and the ways in which we understand excellence, those sorts of things, instead of just you know, going with our gut on making decisions. Um, and then are we um, you know, willing to look at our syllabi? Who are we teaching? Who are we citing? Because if we're just citing the same you know, uh, white dudes, which is not to say that like old bearded white dudes don't have important things to say, they do, but if we're only focusing on those or predominantly focusing on those individuals, what are we missing? Uh, what are we missing in our own understandings and what are we missing opportunities to, to pass on that understanding to other people um, and students? We have to be honest about our lack of fundamental understanding, right? Who are the scholars and people who have shaped our understanding of this history? Has, have, has it been shaped by other people? And, and how have the people in our life shaped our understanding of structural racism? One of the most powerful things that I've, I've done over the last couple of years, and I should say that most of my understanding of this history has come in the last five years, right? So I don't, I don't wanna perpetrate myself as somebody who has always had this understanding and always had this issue at the forefront. This is very new for me um, uh, a, a, as well. But you know, one of the things that was interesting to, for me was to talk to my parents about their, their, their experiences in the 60s. Like, where were they when Martin Luther King was assassinated, right? Um, you know, what was it like for my dad, who was the same age as Emmett Till, to, to hear the news about this, this child who, who traveled from Chicago to uh, the South and, um, you know, allegedly whistled at a white woman and then, you know, several days later ended up beaten to death and drowned in a river, right? You know, um, so, I encourage you all to, if, if you're willing, to talk to the older people, the elders in your life, to understand what they were thinking and how they were interacting with this history, because it's really important to understand those perspectives. Um, and we have to be okay with engaging with these structural inequalities without fragility. It's hard to have these conversations, um, and especially if we see ourselves in a critique, um, but we have to understand that the uh, a critique that we may be perceiving of ourselves is not the end game. The end game is to have fundamentally different structures that um, where power over and discrimination are eliminated, right? And in order to do that, we have to have a more equitable society. We have to confront these things. So two recommendations um, that I have, the 1619 project is pretty self-explanatory. It is a uh, hot button, <laughs> a uh, point of controversy amongst uh, many people. Many people have, um, I think, very well-reasoned and grounded critiques in, in the 1619 Project. Um, and a lot of those critiques come from Black scholars. Um, and then there are a lot of not well-intentioned critiques that are grounded in racism and, and white supremacy. But I think it's a good starting point. This other picture above that is a photo from the Texas Observer, which just released a, um, uh, an issue on the anti-Indigenous handbook. So it's looking at um, uh, the settler colonial project, uh, white supremacy as it relates to Indigenous communities in the United States, in uh, Canada, in Australia, and uh, the Pacific, Pacific Island region. So two pieces where I think it's really important for us to take those up and understand that within our work. All right, so conservation geography, what, what is it? And, and what, are, what, are, what have I been sort of like moving towards? And what am I, um, I'm hoping to, to drive home is that uh, the conservation geography that I want to practice is explicitly anti-racist uh, ecological theory and practice, right? So it's, it's explicitly taking these things up, this history up um, and the stories of human beings and power within these landscapes um, and understanding it within the, the, the realm of species conservation and the like. This photo is, there's so much in this photo, right? I mean, there is a, a threatened antelope species in the foreground. There is a woman carrying a child in the background. There's development. Um, and all of these actors are trying to sort of make a way 
in this world and they all have their stories and they're not, you, it's, it, the more you try to separate them, the less power you have in understanding this situation so that the challenges that the individuals and the communities face can actually, over, can actually be overcome. So it's holding space for this history within the lands that we study. It's not just about the species. It's not just about the, the non-human aspects of it because there is a human story here that relates to what we're observing. So solutions that restore sovereignty and self-determination, uh, at least in, in my practice, are, are paramount. They are the things that are important. Um, and that we, we really need to move away from this and abandon, uh, 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 we need to abandon this insistence on controlling others and others meaning other people and other species, right? There is a lot of restorative work that needs to be done, but ultimately our goal should be stepping away from these environments and, and, and or stepping away from having a very specific hand in the way things are moving. And if we can't do that um, because of, you know, the cascade effects that would happen, then we need to be critical about, well, why are those things necessary, okay? Sorry to go a little bit long. Thank you for staying with me. Um, I've given you all a lot to, to think about, hopefully. Um, and so I, I'll stop there and uh, welcome any questions and comments. Thank you so much.